Dr. Phil. My daughter was stabbed 40 times. Her throat was slit. It was personal. How far will a father go? The police are incompetent. You've accused them of knowing who the killer is. To find his daughter's killer. You've lost your job, house, everything in pursuit of this. You've been showing up at gang leaders' homes, asking questions. Absolutely. That's a good way to get shot. I'm all in. Today's going to be a changing day in your life. You've never had anybody working harder to bring you to the threshold of change than right now. Today we are taking a closer look at two crimes that have gone unsolved for over a decade. One is the story of a serial rapist targeting pretty college-aged women. The search for this serial predator, dubbed by police as the Ramsey Street Rapist, began over 12 years ago. But first, Lindsay was only 24 years old when she was targeted and brutally murdered. Take a look. Sandwich police are casting a wider net as they continue their search for the killer of Lindsay Buziak. Investigators arrived to find 24-year-old realtor Lindsay Buziak stabbed to death inside a home she was showing. Lindsay was stabbed in excess of 40 times. Her breasts were mutilated. Her throat was slit to the point of decapitation. Investigators believe she was lured to the house by a man and a woman posing as prospective buyers. Police told me that initially, Lindsay was stabbed from behind at the base of her skull. Her spinal cord was severed. The details of Lindsay's murder are absolutely horrific. It is nasty. Police have found no evidence of a getaway car or a weapon. Even a search of thousands of cell phone records has so far turned up nothing. Investigators have more questions than answers, such as, was the killing planned, and if so, who was involved? Knowing the details of how Lindsay was executed, she was five foot two and a half, 99 pounds. Her murder was excessive. It was personal. It makes you want to kill. My family and I have established a reward for information. If you know anything, please call the police even if what you know seems inconsequential. You would expect that given the severity of the attack, that we may have had greater success with things such as DNA, and the reality is, is that that's not the case. 11 years after the murder of Victoria realtor Lindsay Buziak, her family still has no answers. Those of you who are involved in Lindsay's murder, we are not going to stop. We are coming for you. Well, Lindsay's father, Jeff, says he is willing to die in pursuit of justice for Lindsay. In fact, he almost did when a gang member pulled a gun on him and threatened his life. I've devoted the last 11 years of my life solely to finding out the conspirators and killers of my daughter. There isn't a day that goes by I'm not thinking about Lindsay's murder. I'm all in. I feel at times I'm putting my life on the line, but it's all for my daughter. I've met with gangsters, drug dealers, criminals to either confront them or find out if they can give me any little bit of information on my daughter's unsolved murder. Sometimes I reach out to the criminals and if I can't reach them, I go to their homes. I've had a gun pulled on me. I've been confronted with physical aggression, people telling me we're putting you down, bitch, and I remain undaunted in my pursuit. I go to these people because I believe they know what went on, and if they don't, they could find out fairly quickly. I went to the morgue, held Lindsay's body. I have said to Lindsay that I would find out who did this to her, and I would not stop trying till I died. Lindsay's unsolved murder has basically destroyed my career, destroyed me financially, and really challenged me psychologically. Until you've walked in my shoes where you've had a child murdered, it means everything to you. And the people that tell me I need to move on, you don't understand. Well, Jeff, I'm, I'm glad you're here, and I am happy to turn a bright, bright light on over this and keep it in people's minds, because it, it's tragic what has happened, and I'm very sorry for your loss. Thank you very much, sir. I really appreciate what you're doing. Uh, this is, th this crime is just horrific. I understand that she was stabbed like 54 times. This doesn't sound like a random attack. It sounds very personal. 
Yes, sir. It's not a random attack. It's personal. It's by someone close to her, someone she knows, someone she knows well. Orchestrated, yeah. planned, and executed. So my you daughter. think this was targeted, and she was showing a house at the time, right? That's correct. She was called to show a home, and she showed up there, and uh, they executed her. The caller that Lindsay talked to uh, was a female. That's correct. She spoke to the female various times, uh, which got her concerned, and then the male called her the day of the showing. Okay, and you said there was a Hispanic accent that set up the appointment for that day at 5.30? Lindsay told me personally that uh, it was a strange accent. That's what alerted her and got her a bit cautious about it. She thought it was uh, Hispanic, but it didn't make sense to her. It didn't sound real. Witnesses saw a blonde woman and a six foot tall man meet Lindsay and enter the house. That's what the witnesses have reported? That's correct. I spoke to one of the witnesses and really they said, Jeff, we were driving by, glanced over, had to look back at the road. Okay. We saw a female meeting a couple. That's okay. what the witness All told right. me. So they believe, and the police believe that she was murdered just within minutes, 10, 11 minutes after entering the house. So she hadn't been in there long. That's correct. Uh, I understand she met the couple at 5.30, and the police say the time of murder was between 5.38 and 5.41. Okay. Now, you've been, you say you've been frustrated with the police, and you even believe that there might be some conspiracy or cover-up here. Why would you think the police would want to cover up a murder? Well, it could be somebody important in town. Lindsay did say she saw something she shouldn't have seen. The police have not been forthright with information or even what they're doing or suspects or anything. So after 11 years, you begin to wonder what's really going on down there at that police station. The truth is, and I know this was in British Columbia, but I know in the United States in 2017, which are the most recent statistics we have, 38.1%, uh, almost 40% of murders committed in the United States went unsolved. Mm -hmm. And if you go back historically across time, that is the case. This is my daughter. This is my child. So I won't accept that. Oh, I don't, I, I don't expect you to. But when you say 11 years, there must be some conspiratorial cover-up. There is an uphill battle here, and they say there was no DNA or fingerprints there. Privately, they've told me they do have some DNA and fingerprints. So there's where my questions begin. I've got lots of false information from police over so the years. So they told you they do have DNA That's and correct, but publicly they say they don't have any. They do not work her murder day by day. Yeah. But you've been working it day by day, nonstop, correct? Absolutely. It was my child. I just can't walk away from this. I work it every day. I have a mandate on myself that I have to do at the very least one thing every day towards helping solve Lindsay's murder. Well, you've been, you've been showing up unannounced at uh, criminals' houses, drug dealers' houses, gang leaders' homes. You just show up unannounced and knock on the door and start asking questions, right? Absolutely. That's a good way to get shot. I'm really not, it is. Typically these people know who I am. I know who they are. So it's not like it's some big surprise. Victoria is a small community. I lived there 28 years. These people know when they see me why I'm coming and they just don't want to talk to me. And so they get aggressive. And Dr. Phil, I live by this belief and this faith that I'm not going to be touched. I'm not going to be touched. And if I am, I'm 64, done my duty. If it's my day, I'm good to go. Yeah, but that's not justice for your daughter is the point. All right, next, from posting the names of town residents he believes are conspirators and conducting polls online about who murdered his daughter, Jeff says, he doesn't care who he upsets as long as it brings his daughter's killer to justice. I want to talk about what he's doing on that front after the break.
I'm very public about my dissatisfaction with police regarding Lindsay's unsolved murder. I don't know anywhere in the world where an organization takes 11 years to accomplish a task. Their task is to solve a murder, and 11 years is not acceptable. Monday. My dad kidnapped me and held me hostage. At the compound, they say, he built in preparation for the end of the world. I was in a trailer with no running water. Was he protecting his son? You tried to convince me I was in a cannabis-induced psychosis. Or isolating him. What right do you have to take him away from his family? He came up to be with me. I was kidnapped. If you're going to lie, then we're never going to be able to move forward. That's Monday. Then on Tuesday. You're sending money to somebody you've never met. Who's really behind this catfish scam? No way. Yeah, way. That's Tuesday. Eight years ago, lindsaybuziakmurder.com was created to provide a place to express opinions about Lindsay's murder. Typically, everybody uses a pseudonym when they post on here, mainly because they fear for their lives. They feel that Lindsay's murder is unsolved for all this time, that if they're exposed as uh, being involved, they could be killed too. The website can be controversial at times because people are named that people or myself think are involved. On a fairly regular basis, I'm threatened with either lawsuits or I get threatened physically. To me, that's just trash. When I hear the threats, that fuels me to push harder. I have no intention of shutting down that website because that is the public forum. Well, it's been 11 years since 24-year-old Lindsay was targeted by unknown suspects and savagely murdered. Now, her father, Jeff, says he believes the police are not only incompetent, but covering up who killed his daughter. I have my own personal theories regarding Lindsay's unsolved murder. I believe Lindsay's boyfriend knows what went on with Lindsay's murder. Police ruled him out as a suspect, but father's intuition tells me otherwise. Every year I hold a public walk for justice in honor of Lindsay. The walk ends at the police station because I feel that's where the responsibility lies to solve Lindsay's murder. I think the police are uh, not handling this investigation properly at all. I believe they're incompetent. They're not doing their job. I'm very public about my dissatisfaction with police. I don't know anywhere in the world where an organization takes 11 years to accomplish a task. Their task is to solve a murder, and 11 years is not acceptable. I don't believe the police are capable of solving this case, and I think they're hiding something, someone, or covering up the murder itself. The police asked me to shut down the Lindsay Buziak murder website. The officers mentioned to me that there are things on the website that could jeopardize the integrity of the case. I asked them, I didn't even know you had a case. Do you have one? And they won't even answer that question. Well, to be very clear, Lindsay Buziak's boyfriend is not considered a suspect, and it has been reported by police that he has passed a polygraph and found to have been very cooperative. Listen, I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I, I'm, I think a, in order for a conspiracy, particularly one to hold together for 11 years, a lot of people have to be involved. A lot of people have to hold together and not crack and or make a mistake in some way. And that's just, I've just been in this for a long, long time and that's highly, highly unlikely. And my experience with law enforcement is that they try and do a really good job, that they work really hard at what they do, they put themselves in harm's way to keep the rest of us safe every day. It doesn't mean there aren't bad apples in every barrel, but my experience has been that they're generally highly devoted, sincere, hardworking men and women. Uh, that's been my experience with law enforcement and I work with them a lot. You've, you've put some very critical things up on the internet against the Sandwich Police Department. On social media, you said the police know who and why and are afraid to say. They screwed this up. They botched their investigation from day one, cannot recover, save face and protect their friends. Police seem to think it is okay to have killers walking free amongst people. And then in interviews with the media, uh, you've, you've questioned their professionalism and competency. You've accused them of knowing who the killer is. 
Dr. Phil, I can give you a recent example. I was out there in December. I had somebody willing to talk to me about information regarding my daughter's murder. I convinced that person to speak to the police, which I always do. That person was not contacted when I returned to Victoria in February. When I questioned the police, they said, oh yeah, we'll put that on our to-do list. But if you don't think the police are competent, if you don't think they're doing what they're doing, and you've got somebody there that says, I have information about who killed your daughter, you just said, well, go tell these incompetent people over here. You didn't say, pull up a chair, tell me what the hell you know. Well, that I, seems in I do that. I offer to fly anywhere people are that tell me they have information, and I'm prepared to do that with that person. But I tell them, I can't make the arrest, so you need to tell the police But this. you didn't want to know what they knew. I go public with everything I know. Well, so you go public I, with a lot more than that. You've gone public with names of who you, who you think's involved. Absolutely. I put their names there, and some of them, their pictures are there. All right, Jeff says when he held Lindsay's lifeless body in the morgue, he promised that he would find her killer. Now he says he doesn't know how much longer he can mentally and physically continue his pursuit. We're going to talk about the toll this is taking on him when we come back. A new episode of my podcast is out with a very special guest. Me, Jimmy Kimmel, right? That's I'm supposed right. to introduce myself here? Yes. You always interview me, and I never get to interview you. A lot of magic has happened between us, you That's know? That's right. I want to ask you a lot of psychological questions. Is there any danger I'll be institutionalized at the end of this? There's a fair <laughs> chance you can get 5150 before you get out of the building. Would you like me to lay down so I could really get into it? Not or? yet. <laughs> Subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher. Well, Jeff says he dropped to his knees when he learned his daughter, Lindsay Buziak, had been brutally murdered. That was 11 years ago, and still the case remains unsolved. Now, this has taken a toll on you mentally, emotionally, physically. Uh, you've lost your job. You've lost really everything, right? House, cars. I mean, you've given up everything in pursuit of this because... This is your number one priority and nothing gets in the way of it, correct? That's correct, Dr. Phil. I pursue this daily and uh, I always say when people ask me, you know, what does that mean to you? I say, all in. I'm all in. What do you think happened? Why do you think she was killed? And she saw something she shouldn't have seen. She was jeopardizing people's lifestyles. They executed her. You say she told you you don't know what it was? No, I don't, Dr. Phil. She said, I can't tell you right now, Daddy, but I will. And I know the reason she said that, because she was in the situation. And she knew that if she told me, I would tell her to remove herself immediately. And she wasn't ready for that. You've related this to the authorities. And they've investigated this and said they have, at this point, no reason to believe that, that any of that is true. They don't have any suspects regarding what you're saying. They don't believe anything is true and they don't have any suspects. I don't know what they do. We did get a statement from them and I'm gonna read it in part. I'm gonna put the whole thing up on drphil.com but here in part is their statement. At no time has the investigation been declared a cold case and an investigative team is presently assigned. We are aware of criticism from some family members. The details of our investigation must remain confidential. While the police will always try to communicate and update families, the necessity of maintaining confidentiality to ensure a successful prosecution remains our priority. The Saanich police remain committed to working in partnership with the RCMP we will continue to work for justice for Lindsay. That's not a truthful statement. They declared it a cold case. They called me into their office on year two and said, Jeff, this is a cold case now. We've done our investigation. So I said, okay, turn over the file to me, which I'm entitled to, and information from the file. So they said, well, why don't you go have lunch and we'll call you after lunch. I did. 
they phoned me while I was at lunch and said, Jeff, we had a meeting. We've decided now it's active, so you don't have access to any of the case. So they will not keep it a cold case because they know I'll get information and so does the media entitled to information. So they just keep it cold case. The other thing not truthful there is the officers assigned are yes assigned to the case as their PR terms, uh -huh. but they work general detective work. That's not acceptable for me. Well, I understand and I, I understand your frustration here, but somebody did this heinous crime and people that do this kind of thing, they talk, they tell somebody. Somebody has heard something about this somewhere and you may not recognize how consequential some little piece of the puzzle you might know, but when it's snapped together with another piece of the puzzle, it can make a difference. So look at this picture. And if you have heard someone talking about this, if you saw something, if you know something, you know, pick up the phone. I don't care if it's been 11 years or 12, 13, 14. This is a crime that deserves to be solved. This man deserves to have justice for his daughter. So if you know something, if you can help, please, please, please pick up the phone, give a tip to the authorities, and let's see if we can get this thing solved. That's what we're here for. That's what we want. Thank you. Okay? Thank you. All right. Fair enough? Thank you, Thank you very much, Thank sir. You. All right. Next, she survived a predator who authorities have been hunting for 12 years, a serial rapist attacking a young woman on a three-mile stretch off of Ramsey Street in Fayetteville, North Carolina. We're going to talk about that after the break. My attacker grabbed my throat. I never saw his face. We formed a task force. Thousands of hours were spent processing evidence and we're unable to identify him. Summer is the season. Most kids look forward to no school, lots of free time, and warm days to go out and play. But for many children, summer means a lot less to eat. During the school year, more than 22 million children receive free or reduced lunches, but in the summer, that number drops to just below 4 million. During the summer, Feeding America member food banks help provide free and nutritious meals to kids who depend on them during the school year. Find out how you can help feed a child this summer by going to drphil.com because summer is no fun when you're hungry. In March of 2006, police say a man began stalking and sexually assaulting young women as young as 15 years old along a stretch of street in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Now, Kobe says she was a junior in college when she became the Ramsey Street Rapist's fifth victim. The purpose of this conference is to notify the public of a suspect targeting women in the northern portion of Ramsey Street. Most victims say they were raped in an apartment or a condominium. One woman says she was raped while she was running in the area. The rapes instilled fear among the residents of that North Fayetteville, Ramsey Street area. The Ramsey Street rapist is a particular type of woman he was looking for. White females in their 20s. I remember my assault like it was yesterday. It was a night that I will never forget. My roommate and our mutual friend went to bed around 10 or 11. I fell asleep watching TV in the living room that night. I woke up suddenly to a pillow being pushed down on my face. My attacker also grabbed my throat. He told me that if I screamed or made any noise that the other two would get it. She says he took her outside the apartment and raped her while two friends slept in another room. I decided that I was going to cooperate. Therefore, he was not aggressive during the attack. I never saw his face, but I do remember his voice. The last 11 years, I've lived in constant fear, looking over my shoulder, um, knowing that he had my address. Was he going to come looking for me? Was he going to try to find me? We formed a task force for, for this case. Thousands of hours were spent by our department. Hundreds of hours were spent by the state crime lab processing evidence and uh, probably spent several years on, on these cases and were unable to identify him. Well, Kobe, it's good to meet you. I'm really glad you're here willing to talk about this because it makes a big difference. You, you say you woke up with a pillow over your face and your, your throat 
just tightly grabbed, you were in his control the second you woke up, right? Yes. And you still remember there was a odor and a, a distinct voice, yet you never saw his face, correct? Yeah, his, um, the smell was almost like a, a sickening sweet. That's, you know, the best way I can think to describe it. Um, and he definitely had a very southern drawl mm -hmm. when he spoke. And you, you, do you know how he got in? He broke in through the sliding glass door on our back patio. What went through your mind at that time? What was your thought process? I wanted to cooperate so there wasn't any harm done to anybody else and to get him out of there mm -hmm. as fast as I could. He starts taking you out back and you go, what, 100 yards mm -hmm. into a wooded area? Yeah, it was um, from our back patio. It went through like a little tree line and then there's an open field that okay. is where the attack started. Did you think this was that he was intending to rape you or to kill you or both? What was your what was your thinking? Was this going was this question in your head? It was at that time I really wasn't 100 percent sure what his intentions were. I hadn't seen or felt any kind of weapon yet, so I didn't quite have that fear yet that he wanted to kill me. And you're there how long? I would say not even 10 minutes. Okay. Then he brings you back where he found you, correct? Yes. What's the last thing he said to you? The last thing he said to me was, go inside, sit down, don't call the cops, and make sure you lock the door behind you this time. Did you find that odd? Yeah, because I second guess all the time whether I actually left the door unlocked or not. He took your ID. He took my entire purse that uh, had my phone, my wallet, my ID. And your fear, of course, is that he knew where you lived. Yeah. Well, after over a decade of searching, a suspect was finally arrested and charged after DNA ancestry websites helped provide a break in this case. Plus, Kobe says that nearly 12 years after her attack, she is still haunted by what happened to her. We're going to talk about all that after the break. Daryl Bowden stood quietly as the 32 felony charges against him were read out loud in court. We drove down for the bond hearing. I felt every emotion, fear, anxiety. Anger was a big one. I could not bring myself to make eye contact. Monday. My dad kidnapped me and held me hostage. At the compound, they say, he built in preparation for the end of the world. I was in a trailer with no running water. Was he protecting his son? You tried to convince me I was in a cannabis-induced psychosis. Or isolating him. What right do you have to take him away from his family? He came up to be with me. I was kidnapped. If you're going to lie, then we're never going to be able to move forward. That's Monday. Then on Tuesday. You're sending money to somebody you've never met. Who's really behind this catfish scam? No way. Yeah, way. That's Tuesday. Fayetteville police say that over the past 12 years, they never stopped searching for the man they call the Ramsey Street Rapist. But just last year, there was a huge break in the case, which led to the arrest of a suspect. Police say they have caught the man known as the Ramsey Street Rapist in Fayetteville. 43-year-old Darrell Bounden was arrested last night by Fayetteville police and U.S. Marshal agents at his home. It's about five miles away from where a series of rapes had occurred. Police say they tracked him down using the same DNA testing that caught the Golden State Killer. We got a match yesterday. Yeah, I'm just glad we got the guy finally. The morning I got the phone call that a suspect was captured, it was a huge relief. It literally felt like a weight had been lifted off my shoulders. Darrell Bowden stood quietly as the 32 felony charges against him were read out loud in court. The 43-year-old is accused of raping six women between 2006 and 2008. We drove down for the bond hearing, and that was the first time that I ever saw him in person. I felt every emotion, fear, 
anxiety. Anger was a big one. I could not bring myself to make eye contact. Every time I would glance at him, even for a brief moment, I would feel nauseous knowing the things that he had not only done to me, but to other women. Most victims say they were raped in an apartment or a condominium. One woman says Bowden raped her while she was running in the area. I still struggle wondering what I could have done to make sure that this guy was captured and that he wouldn't hurt anybody else. In the back of my mind, I just still have that guilt. Well, joining us is Lieutenant John Summerendike. He is a Special Victims Unit Commander for the Fayetteville Police Department and has been dedicated to solving this case. Um, Lieutenant, thank you so much for being here. I really, really appreciate it. Now, this, this is something that you worked on across time. I want to take a look at the, the timeline of this because on March 31st of 2006, uh, the village of Carver's Falls Apartments, there was an attack. Then August 23rd of 06, 4400 Ramsey Street. Then February 12th, 07, Bubble Creek Park Court Apartments. Then March 6, 2007, a second assault at the village at Carver's Falls Apartments. Then September 18th, 2007, Kobe's assault uh, at the Heather Ridge Apartments. Then January 26th of 08, a second assault at Bubble Creek Court Apartments. So we, we have this just really centralized here. It lives about five miles north of the Fayetteville city limits is where you know, Ramsey Street ends at the city limits um, in a small community you know, called Linden. So probably for every single one of these cases, by the time we arrived on scene, he's probably already safe back at home. An arrest has now been made. Yes. And this is four months after sending DNA to C.C. Moore, uh, where some DNA comparisons could be made. And so the arrest has been made, but it's there's been no conviction yet. So still a suspect, so it's still alleged uh, at this point. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Now, not only is she responsible for the arrest of a suspect in the Ramsey Street rapist case, she has also helped authorities identify suspects in 38 cold cases in the last 10 months, all from her couch. We're gonna meet this extraordinary woman and learn how she does it after the break. Law enforcement here and around the country using genetic genealogy to solve cold cases. CC Moore, head of the genetic genealogy unit at Parabon Nano Labs, her unit cracked the cold case after her lab combined DNA evidence samples from the case with a public genealogy database. Do you need Dr. Phil's help? Text Phil to 88500 and share your story for a chance to appear on the show. Standard message and data rates may apply. We've all heard of the popular DNA Ancestry websites where by just spitting in a tube, you can unlock the key to your heritage and long lost relatives. Well, now it is helping solve seemingly once unsolvable cold cases. Cece Moore is the chief genetic genealogist at Parabon. CC is considered the foremost expert in the field of genetic genealogy and has co-founded the Institute of Genetic Genealogy. She spent years helping adults reunite with their biological families after being abandoned as children. Now she's adding solving cold cases to her resume, all from the comfort of her own home. Take a look. Information you share about your family's DNA might be helping authorities catch suspects wanted for violent crimes. Fable police use genetic genealogy DNA testing to help locate Bowden. What makes the police announced an arrest in the 2006 murder of Scott Martinez? Virginia Freeman stabbed and strangled. DNA in genealogical research has pinpointed a killer. A mother's torment as her daughter's killer is sentenced for molesting and killing little April Tinsley. We're so numb and emotional right now. CeCe Moore, head of the genetic genealogy unit at Parabon Nano Labs, 
Her unit cracked the cold case after her lab combined DNA evidence samples from the case with a public genealogy database. Law enforcement here and around the country using genetic genealogy to solve cold cases and give victims' families justice. I think about the victim's family all the time when I'm doing the work. I mostly just hope that it brings a sense of closure and peace. Well, so you understand, CeCe's work helped arrest a suspect, Daryl Wayne Bowden, in the Ramsey Street rapist case. But she has never met Kobe in person until now. CeCe, come out and please meet this young woman. It's so nice to see you. <laughs> How you doing? Really good. Oh my gosh, the makeup on your chest. <laughs> Hi. Good to see you. How are nice you? Nice to see you again. Yeah. I know Dr. Phil better than you might think. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Cece, uh, Cece knows a lot about me and a lot about my family because um, uh, I did a, a show called Finding Your Roots on uh, PBS uh, with Professor Gates, and you did all the DNA work. Here is an example of how Cece narrows in on a suspect, and it all starts with the match. And Cece, kind of walk us through this. So the crime scene DNA is compared to a database called GEDmatch. And there's about 1.2 million people in that database. We're looking for people that share significant stretches of DNA with that suspect. And then based on how much DNA someone shares with him, I can reverse engineer his family tree based on their family trees. So our chart here shows two different matches. They each share about 1% of their DNA with our unknown suspect, which means they're probably third cousins with him. They also share DNA with each other, which means they should have a common ancestral couple. Mm -hmm. So if I can figure out how match number one and match number two are related, then I know that the suspect also has to descend from that same common ancestor. This particular case was a little bit more complicated than that, mm -hmm. um, but this is sort of the general mm -hmm. idea of the work that I'm doing. It helps them go identify a suspect, then they can start the investigation from there mm -hmm. as opposed to just shooting in the dark. Right, I'm providing a highly scientific tip but the investigators still have to build that case against that person. Right. There's no way they would arrest based on genetic genealogy. They'd only be able to do that if they could confirm my findings and build a case against that right. person. And there have been a lot of cases that have been solved. Uh, Raymond Charles uh, Rowe murdered and raped a 25-year-old elementary school teacher. Uh, the case was 25 years old. Uh, you helped identify him and he pled guilty. John Dale Miller uh, murdered and molested an eight-year-old girl. The case was 30 years old. He was identified and pled guilty. Uh, Spencer Glenn Monette raped a 79-year-old woman. The case was three months old. He was identified and pled guilty. So these are just some of the cases that through this work they were identified. How can you at home uh, help CC crack her next cold case. We'll talk about that after the break. Well, I've been speaking with CC Moore, who is a pioneer in the field of genetic genealogy. She's now using her skills to solve some of the country's most notorious cold cases, and you at home can help. So, how can viewers at home help by building out this database even more? There are about 26 million people who have participated in consumer DNA testing. So they might have tested at Ancestry DNA, 23andMe, MyHeritage DNA, but law enforcement doesn't have access to those databases. And so if someone has taken a test like this, they can choose to download their raw data. That's their genetic A, T, Cs, and Gs in a file, and they can upload it to a public website called GEDmatch or GEDmatch Genesis. Mm -hmm. If they do that and they make it public, then that's available for us to help law enforcement resolve these cold cases. And we've even been working some active cases as well. Has my data been uploaded? 
No, you would have to have given okay. permission for that. Well, I, I give permission for that. So if, if you know how to do it, you I have I have my... your data, so I could. <laughs> okay, you have my data? I do. Well, will I... you do it for me? Sure. There sure. you go. And I hope you'll all join me in doing that as well. So thank please do that. And thank much. you for your work. <laughs> how are you doing after all of this? Are you doing better knowing that this person's caught? It's been better. Still have daily struggles. If I were to arrange some very specialized help for you to kind of get some, make some progress on healing these, these wounds that have been left behind uh, by this. Is this something that you would avail yourself of? Absolutely. I would really appreciate that. Okay, She's we'll, we'll so do great, that. isn't she? Yes, she forward is. Like this? Yeah, so, so we want to help you out. Okay. I want to thank all of my guests today, and a special thanks to C.C. Moore and Parabon for all the good work they're doing. Also, thanks to Lieutenant John Summerendike. If you at home have any information about Lindsay Buziak's murder, please call 1-888-980-1919, and I'll have those numbers up on our website as well. Also, if you have any information in connection to the Ramsey Street Rapist, please call the Fayetteville Police Department at 910-433-1851 or Crime Stoppers at 910-483-TIPS. If you have a question for me, please go to drphil.com. Don't forget to follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And don't forget to subscribe to my new podcast called Fill in the Blanks. That's P-H-I-L in the Blanks. It's free. Just hit the subscribe button. We'll see you next time. Thanks so much. Peace again.